Ah, oh, here we go. I mean, I think this was probably very early on. I mean, she looked good. <laughs> she was cool. Michelle, that's one of Mum's best friends. Grandma, Smoking in bed. Naughty. So from when we moved from our last house, we had literally so many photo albums, didn't we? We recently gave Trees of the job to go through and literally stack up all the photos and put them kind of in roughly the correct years, which is hard because you can't really tell by photos, but it's so nice because we've got all of mum's old photos and even though you can tell in videos, home videos, that she's really shy, like she is in so many photos, isn't she? Oh, yeah. Like there's so many, but it's so nice to just have all these memories. Yeah, this car was one of my mum's cars, which is a green beetle, had to have the best of the best. And 2006, this is way before I was born, my date of birth is the 20th of the 6th. Wow. How weird is that? Yeah. That's my favourite photo of Sarah yeah, and Mum. Yeah, yeah. That's a capital more in Ibiza. I love that. That's Sarah. definitely in Ibiza. 100%, yeah. That is, that is a famous photo, because I used to post that a lot when I was younger, because I love that photo. They just look like supermodels. <laughs> this is a picture of Mum. Oh, it's... It, Nan! <laughs> I give up. Okay. It's just going to be bloopers of us going, Nan! Tea! <laughs> So here's a newspaper cutting of this one. Of, must have been one of her jumping shows. Yeah, Fort Hill, I think it was. Yeah, Fort Hill. And she's horse riding, and it must have made it in the papers for some reason. This is a picture of Nan, um, Mum, Granddad, and me. So that was 24 years ago. This pic. Wow. I often try to pick myself up and put myself way back in the years before I was born, which is crazy. And almost like put myself in my nan's shoes, put myself in my auntie's shoes, because I know they've all got such different perspective viewpoints. I can't even begin to imagine what my nan went through and what all my family members went through. It's almost a blessing that Joel and I were so young when all this happened that it didn't impact us maybe as much as it impacted everyone else. Do you remember anything about being a kid? With mum, yeah, I remember going to see her when we'd, um, we'd go swimming at the Lido. Do you remember that? Yeah, of course. I'd always get like a present off her. I remember like clearly that like, this big toy car that opened up. I think it was like a Mini Cooper, but there was loads of little ones inside and I've still got one in my room with the little ones. Just does like a little memory. But other than that, like, there's not really too much that I remember because I was so young. Okay. Can see you now. So the connections Nikki met in Ibiza, uh, when we came back, um, she started um, buying ecstasy sort of in bulk and Nikki sold out her stash within the first half an hour of the club. It didn't take long before Nikki was really quite well known on the scene and people would be waiting at the club for her. We stopped having to queue up to get in. All of a sudden life changed quite a lot. There was a lot of money going around. Nikki could do anything she turned her hand to. Anything that Nikki ever did she would always do to a very high standard. I remember when she came back home for a while and took a swimming course. Before we knew where she was, Nikki was teaching at the swimming pool virtually. I, mean, I knew at first that she was selling ecstasy tablets in clubs and all that, but that wasn't enough to feed her habit in, I don't think. So she was always, I always used to see her or speak to her and she'd be down Marks and Spencers because what she used to do was pick up jumpers, coats, walk around the other entrance. This is when you didn't need receipts and then take them back and get the money from them. In the end, she got found out of that, but the staff just kept recognising her. She used to wear wigs and hats and sunglasses to um, disguise herself as it got on, because she got recognised everywhere she went in the end. It was crazy. She had to shoplift to feed her habit, didn't she? I'd get 
telephone calls from probation officers, from prisons and courts. It would be Nikki at first. Mum, Mum, you've got to talk to these because they're going to arrest me. And she wanted me to go and get her out every time because I was well presented, I was a manager of a club. I'd be cooking dinner, the phone would go, and that was it. Dinner out the window, there was an emergency, Nikki had to be picked up, or Nikki done this, or something could happen, you know, or Nikki was in the police station. Everybody around us, we all knew about it once it all came. We had to learn pretty quick. What other way can you get money? So she had to go out and shoplift, and she was good at it, shoplifting. She was very good at it. I can remember looking in Nikki's wardrobe and it was absolutely jam-packed with really expensive designer clothes. The flat was a complete mess. From what I gather from that was that there was a lot of crime still going on. I think that to sustain the drug habit, the crack cocaine habit that they had at the time, that had escalated and indeed what happened at the end was uh, the door got pushed in and it was raided by the police. That was my thing, shoplifting. All good shoplifters, you know, like all heroin addicts become good shoplifters because that's their best way of getting money. So I'd wake up in a drug den. This is my typical day. It smells horrendous. I'm in a crack den. There are women in there. There are men in there, all different backgrounds. Now I've got to go out and withdraw from heroin. Now withdrawals from heroin is a really awful thing. You're so desperate. You wake up in the morning, it's called cold turkey. So I've got to get out now and get a certain amount of money. So I've got to go out and find 500 quid. So I go to all the department stores around London, you, you know, your big West End, well-known names, and I'd get things like Ralph Lauren, Giorgio Armani, Hugo Boss, and I'd sell it. So picture this, so I've gone out, I've just been given 500 quid. I've not eaten for four or five days, right? I've not brushed my teeth for weeks. So I've had some underwear on for a week or two. And anyone in their right mind would go and buy a clean pair of underpants, a toothbrush, and some food. I don't. I'll go and give every single penny to that drug dealer. Back to sleep have as many hits as possible, wake up in some crack den with a load of strangers I've never met before, men and women. And we had, some, we had so much in common, one thing was all drug addicts. Nikki loved crack cocaine. It's an incredibly addictive drug with an incredible feeling of instant euphoria. With crack, I think people need to understand that it is a very, very highly addictive drug that is instantaneous in its demand for your attention. It's not a slow walk up to it, it's a... She just took to it like a duck to water. She really enjoyed it. A couple of times it was brought back to the flat after um, a night out. Never seen it before. And I can remember watching sort of behaviors change around it when it was being, when it was being done, I can remember seeing, at the end of a session, I can remember seeing some of the guys crawling around on the carpet looking for tiny little specks and thinking, wow, this is something, this is something different, you know, this is a different level. And I spoke to people and they'd said that they'd never known anyone, that the amount of intake or crack she could take on a session, she was very, she had a, a really high threshold to the amount of drugs she could take. And the only real thing that can help anybody come down from crack is heroin and the two are code D's or you know they're bedfellows. We've discussed it amongst Nikki's friends when we've talked about what happened to Nikki and how she ended up getting involved in heroin because it wasn't her thing it was always the cocaine but I think she was with a group of guys that were using crack cocaine for fun and good times and then at the end of the evening they would all get out the heroin and bring themselves down. And Nikki would still be left up there from the crack cocaine, you know. And so she would have to sort of really work hard to sort of bring herself down and get to the place that they were all, everyone else was all relaxed and at a certain down level. It's all, you know, up, down, up, down. When you take crack, right, you want to, you get such a high off of it, but it only lasts about five minutes. Whether you smoke it on a pipe, or you inject it, you get this great big high and then you come down. But what people do is they want to come down to a level where they can take it again, where they get back to that state of where it's completely out of your system, so you get that high again. Because if you keep piping, smoking it, or injecting it, without the heroin, you stay at the same sort of level of highness. So with the heroin, the heroin brings you back down really low, and then bang, you're ready for your next hit or your pipe, and it bang up again. So that's what it is, you know, people obviously, when they get on heroin, take the crack and then the heroin to bring them back down again. That's what I should do. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take one without the other in the end, I couldn't. When did it become a concern for you personally? I think it's when she um, started doing heroin, really, because she'd never said she'd do that before. 
she said to me, if ever you catch me or hear that I have done heroin, I want you to come up and punch me in the face. And I said, Nikki, I will. Trust me, I will. But the truth is, when something like that happens in your group, she's not that person saying, come on, punch me in the face. She's, what are you talking about? You know, I'm not doing anything. You know, that's not, you know, I'm not involved in that. What, you know, you're mad. It's not them, it's the drugs. She wasn't the same person. She didn't want me to punch her in the face when she was on the drugs. When she did want me to punch her in the face was when she was Nikki. You know, I should have done it. A good friend would have done it, but she was a different person. She didn't really want me to do it. If they wanted to do this, they weren't going to be able to stay. They wanted to be in their own bubble where they could live this life without having to explain to anybody else what they were doing. You know, they were in this love bubble, this drug bubble. When St John's Wood flat came to an end, they got busted, so they moved on. And I think they probably stayed for a while round at Guy's mum's, but I don't think it, it wasn't the place you want to live for very long round there. I think they went for a season, they went off to Ibiza. We heard stories that they were not doing very well out there, that they were really skin, they were in the gutter, they weren't doing very well. So we all spoke in a family and me and John decided, my boyfriend at the time, decided to go out there for a holiday and see them and, and find out what was going on. But when we got out there, it wasn't really what we thought. I just think people were saying basically they were heavy on drugs out there because they were living the life. But what I did notice is that they were dodging a lot of places. Obviously, they were ripping people off all the time for however they were doing it, I don't know. So I think they burnt all their bridges in Ibiza and they went to Amsterdam next. When she was back and forth to Ibiza and Amsterdam and places like that, I was a bit I was only young at the time, so I was a bit naive to it all, so I just thought that was a done thing. She just always just seemed to do the right thing to me. She, she, she was just like a role model. Now, nobody really knows what went on in Amsterdam, but I do know that when they came back, something quite heavy had gone on because Guy actually brought Nikki back to Madeleine's and said, Nikki, these are your friends. I want you to be here for a while. Please, just be here for a while. And she started to meet all new people and a new chapter sort of started. She started hanging around with Lee and she obviously met Ray then and she had a soft spot for Ray. I was 18 and I was offered to live in a place down at Enfield Lock by Ray, which was Sydney and Joel's dad. She had started um, going out with Lee and his friends. We used to go to clubs and all that, and that's when Nikki used to she'd be there sometimes as well, and she got chatty and friendly with Ray, and that's when they started to form a relationship. I can remember going to a party with her and her telling me about Ray, who was Lee's best friend, and her saying to me, mad you know, I just find him so attractive we were all really over the moon because she'd found somebody he was a little bit he was out of all that scene and she fell pregnant and I must admit I, I wasn't horrified when she fell pregnant because she was doing quite well but I think Nikki falling pregnant it brought far too much pressure on her when I heard Nikki was pregnant I was a bit concerned because yeah. well having had a difficult pregnancy myself I was worried about how she would cope with the restrictions that a pregnancy uh, put on her. And I also knew that everybody would be on Nikki. Everybody would be watching her like a hawk, telling her what she could, couldn't do. Life was quite hard for her in lots and lots of ways. It was, it was really hard for Nikki. I'm no expert, but I think once Nikki had experienced the sort of high she could get from drugs. She did struggle with finding real life quite boring. A lot of drug addicts think kids are gonna sort them out. You know, having children is gonna help straighten you out and put you back on the level playing field. But the truth is, of course, the pressures of 
being pregnant and the responsibilities of having children can do exactly the opposite, you know. There's so much stress involved in that situation that it's a dangerous position if you're prone to addiction or prone to the drug lifestyle. I'm not saying people should or shouldn't have kids. If you're not responsible enough to get out and brush your teeth in the morning, why are you going to be responsible to take care of another child, you know? So your mum was unwell. She's really, really mentally, spiritually, physically unwell. That's, that's the nature of addiction, you know? Just that humiliation every day, that desperation. It's just, you know, we're all in the same boat here. This drug has, has, has totally consumed every single, you know, cell in our body that we have no control, we have no conscious. I'm not aware of anybody or anything apart from this drug of myself. <laughs> Sydney in a teddy outfit. Sydney is a teddy. Yeah. Are you standing up? Are you standing up? Where's that cheesy smile? Do that cheesy one. Do the cheesy one. I don't remember living with my mum and dad. So way back we started off, we could only see our parents with social services. Getting picked up, going there for like half a day and then coming home and then going into like, obviously now I know it was like a centre where it was like a safe environment, but I just thought it was just a day out. There needed to be someone like monitoring the visitations. And then as time went on, Nan, I think, would have made the decision that we could see my mum with family and we could see my dad with family, but like on different sides. So with mum, we'd see my nan and then with my dad, we'd see my other grandparents. I always say my childhood was as normal as it could have been. And I think that was my nan's priority to make it seem so normal. Yeah, I, was, I had a life with my nan and granddad, but I had everything else was the same as maybe even better than what I would have had with mum. And I remember her even saying as we grew up, like, I always wanted to be friends with your friends' mums. Like, I just didn't want it to seem like you were being brought up by your grandparents. Obviously, the only difference was, like, we called them nan and granddad. At school, people, most people were just, especially when I was younger, they were curious, like, oh, where's your mum? Oh, how come is this always your nan or granddad? Earlier on, I didn't really know how to, like, explain it to people some like a few people that I don't know whether they meant it or not but said it in like a negative way and I didn't know how to deal with that this was young so I didn't really know how to deal with it they didn't know what they was doing the little good memories I did have from when I was younger I didn't I didn't want to know the bad stuff I just wanted to hold on to the like the nice things When you was born, oh, it was an awful situation because we knew knew what was going on. We knew Nikki was doing drugs, but she didn't tell the hospital. When Nikki was pregnant with Sydney, she was doing crack cocaine, so it goes straight into the child's bloodstream. When you was born, you had this high-pitched scream. I know it. I, if I hear it, I know it. It's the way a crack baby would cry. When Nikki became pregnant again and she had to have Joel, um, she phoned me up at work all sort of excited to say, by this time, Sydney was living with me, and she said, Mum, guess what, I'm pregnant. Well, you could have dropped to feather. When she said she was pregnant again, oh my God, we were so... Because we'd seen what happened the first time round, we was like, what's gonna happen now? She went, are you there? I said, yeah. I said, what are you gonna do? She went, well, Ray seems to think if we have it, you know, it will bring us together again. I said, it doesn't work like that, Nikki. You've already got one daughter, and she's living with me. 
I knew what it would do. It would send her over the edge again, having another child. And that was it. I took her to the hospital and I wanted the hospital to know what was happening. So I told everybody at the hospital that she was a drug addict. Now, this was the biggest bombshell that I'd ever dropped because all of a sudden the hospital took over. They wanted her to go to a counsellor because they was worried that she'd go off and have the baby somewhere on her own. Also, once she had the baby, they wouldn't let them take the baby from the hospital. Joel was on an alarm pad. We told the hospital, so the social services were involved. Social services had phoned me up to say that we're going to take Joel away from his mother today. Then the next thing I got was your mum on the phone. Mum, they're coming to take my baby away. They're going to take my baby away. Don't let them. You can imagine. That, I couldn't, it doesn't get any worse than that. It doesn't get any worse because I can't stop them because he shouldn't have been living with mum because he was still on crack. Every time she smoked it, he was inhaling it. Every time she put him in the car and took him out, he was getting a hit. I'm on the underground coming back from scoring. Do I feel good? No, I feel like shit. I don't know who I'm trying to kid, but at the end of the day, I'm only kidding myself. It's Sunday morning, I've woken up feeling sad and lonely. I want to see my baby girl, I miss her so much. The thing is that when I do get to see through this mad, sad life I'm leading, there's no very sad, lonely, mixed up lady. And mum as well. They are two of the most important people in my life. I wish, I wish Ray was, but he's not, and that's that. I still love him anyway. Tomorrow's Monday, a new week, and it's time I was at home facing up to things. I wish I could close my eyes and when I open them, I would be out shopping with Mum in Sydney. It would be Saturday afternoon and it's a few weeks till Christmas and we're doing our last few bits of shopping. Look over to Mum and she, she is happy. I can see in her eyes, I'm clean and she's so happy. When Nikki was living away from us, we didn't see her very often. We always really worried about her. I um, knew she would see her, so I was a bit skint at the time. So I got her. Right. So my little nickname for her was Nikki Mouse. So the little mouse on there, and I used to make these little things. So I bought her all these stones, and they all mean different things, and it was to protect her because we didn't know what was going on in her life. And um, when she died and we went through her belongings, they came back to me, so she'd kept them with her all those years, which I think was lovely. Mm. Oh, dear. And now I've got them. And uh, they didn't work. <laughs> but, you know, we never know. Maybe they kept her out of some harm. So they live in here, in my little special cabinet. There we go. your story about when you heard mum had gone into the hospital and the week of her death. Okay. So... It's probably a lot worse than we thought it was going to be because of pipes and everything coming out of her and just Watching her fight for every breath is just the worst thing ever. No uh, response from her at all. And I went and I made amends to Nanny. 